All right. Um, I, I want to start off a little differently tonight. Um, obviously, and, and people have already commented on it, this is a, uh, a, a, a tragically appropriate topic for right now because of all the things that are going on. And one of the realities of all of our lives, from our earliest awareness of what was going on in the world, there has been an Arab-Israeli conflict in some stage, whether it was explosive or they were in the middle of a peace process and we, were had, we had some hopes up, or there was another explosion in another war. And uh, I mean, even in the period between the 67 war and 73, that period was called the war of attrition because there was fighting going on. It wasn't a prolonged war. It was usually a day battle here and a day battle there, but they were fighting. I heard it called the Suez War because the Air Forces were fighting over the Suez Canal. On the mm -hmm. uh, General, the Israelis call it the War of Attrition. So what I thought we would start off with is even before we talk about Yom Kippur, which I think of as, as one of the centrally determinative events in the Middle East, uh, just for people to give their own opinions about what's going on right now um, and... Uh, and, and understand that we won't all necessarily see it the same way, and we may strongly disagree with people, but that's fine. But if anybody wants to make some some comments on on events of uh, the last two weeks, um, uh, it might be a way to start this. We hardly know what to say, Michael. It's so overwhelming and terrifying. I, I, well, I, I'll, I'll throw out a thought here. I think one of the things that is truer and truer of wars is that the real victims are civilians. It used to be army against army. And to some degree, 1967 and 1973 were basically armies versus army. There were some bombings of cities, yes. But it was primarily, you know, one tank division versus another, et cetera. But what is going on now is, is really victimizing on all sides uh, civilian populations. Uh, I mean, I think there were 1,400 dead Israelis in the, in the first day of uh, Hamas attacks. And in the whole war of Yom Kippur, it was around 2,400. Yeah. So, uh, you know, almost in one day, uh, that was matched, and we've had, I, I don't know the number of Palestinian deaths, uh, Hamas deaths, but I'm sure it's uh, up there in the same ballpark, well over a thousand. I it's think it was. Yeah, Reba. Well, um, since you're inviting comments, I think that, um, the I think there's uh, uh I, th I think I have some apprehension about being here because um, my uh, opinion is no matter whose opinion, there aren't any winners when there's a war. So my, my opinion is that literally wars, wars, not, you know, uh, there aren't any winners. Um, and so I have some apprehension about uh, the audience here uh, being very vehement who's um, should be winning or shouldn't be winning or whether there was a winning in Yom Kippur. Uh, so there may be a certain tolerance that I have to being able to listen. It depends how this goes. Okay. So, um, uh, but I am very interested in the history because Yom Kippur War has been brought up on the news over and over again. Um, and uh, I don't want to give you the uh, illusion that I don't have an opinion. Oh, no. No. <laughs> but on a, on, a, on a Zoom conference and uh, on an educational session, um, you know, I, I don't know that I'm going to Okay, that. perfectly but fair. I, but I think, I think just tread softly here, the audience. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, th there are very yeah. uh, rough feelings that people have, and it's easy to trigger them. Uh, yeah. Farron, I thought I... Yes, I, I, I like Reba, I honestly, this, this has been the amount of blood that's on the, the, the land in that area one cannot begin to say winner or loser because no one has won so far. 
there's only one thing I think I'm going to say today. Okay. I'm just going to listen because it's interesting to note that during the Ottoman Empire, Palestine, there were Palestinian Jews, Palestinian Muslims, and Palestinian Christians living in that land that's called Palestine. Yes. I don't know if they were living at peace, but they were certainly living together. Comes the mandate, the Palestinian mandate, and the whole thing is turned upside down. And honest to God, that's all I have to say. Okay. No, and, and uh, that is really where this all starts. You have Jewish immigration coming in under that mandate. You have Arabs angry about that. You have the British unable to waffling on what how they want to handle it. And uh, no, it it's that's that the role of the British has been taken over by the United States, and so now we are uh, facing the same insoluble problems. All right. Uh, if nobody else wants to make comments, I'm going to get us started. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, I keep hearing people in the news. They say this is like the Holocaust. This is like 9/11, and there's like two historic events that it reminds me of that nobody's mentioned. And they are. Well, one is Tet, where the North Vietnamese got the. The South Vietnamese communists, the VC, to rise up and attack the Americans, and, and took over the American embassy, and and basically got slaughtered. Yeah, I mean they put a scare in the United States. Yes, no doubt about that. But they militarily lost uh, politically, uh, but they they were able to clear out the South Vietnamese communists. So when they ultimately took over, they could put their communists in power. And here they have we have the Iranians getting the, the Gazans to attack the Israel, Israelis, and they're just back in Tehran. It's just great for them because there's dead Jews and there's dead Sunnis, and that's what the yeah. Ayatollahs want. And and the Gazans should realize they're just being duped. So that's one. Okay. Okay. I'll give you comments yeah. on that. Uh, no, what, one of the, one of the I think interesting things about Tet is that fits with with Yom Kippur. The Arabs were clearly winning in the first three days. In the first phase of the Tet Offensive, mm -hmm. they were winning. Okay. And then <laughs> event turned around, and that's the same thing that happened. The same pattern that follows in this one. Okay. And my other my other historic event that I think is a good parallel is Fort Mims. If you're familiar with that. No. Okay, because yeah, I learned about that, you know, later in life. Um, that's been forgotten by the United States. But uh, on nine ten, that was the greatest uh, attack on the United States. Uh, but it was just forgotten. Uh, in the War of eighteen twelve, uh, there was some small fortification in which there were. In, in the southeast, in which there were American military, but there were an awful lot of civilians, you know, civilian men, civilian women, civilian children, civilian babies. And the Indians went in and killed everybody, uh, butchered the babies, mm -hmm. the same as happened a week ago. Uh, and like 500 Americans of all ages died. Uh, Results, uh, of course, got the United States, got the uh, militias of the various states, particularly the Tennessee militia under Andrew Jackson. They're going to start fighting the Indians. And the interesting thing is, a couple, a couple of interesting things happened. Um, one of the battles against the Indians. At the end of the battle, there's some Indian toddler who the soldiers bring up to Jackson. What should we do with them? You know, like using good bayonet practice, whatever. And Andrew Jackson says, uh, this poor orphan has lost everything. Send them back to, to Tennessee. My wife, but my wife, we're going to adopt him. He's, I'll raise him as my son. Didn't know that. And uh, got the kid in the point when he was old enough on the point at the West Point, but then he had he got some disease and died, showing Andrew Jackson's mercy towards him. Well, okay. Thank you. You know, because we never hear that. No, no. Andrew Jackson. This, no, I, no. Uh, as, 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 his, his history with Indians I, I, is... I, I think Andrew Jackson, well, 
I'm I'm not a psychologist, so I can't diagnose people, but he sure looks like Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so so then the, the mastermind of the uprising <laughs> somehow snuck into Andrew Jackson's camp and pled for mercy. And Andrew Jackson was so impressed with Weatherford, I forget his first name, that it was with his courage that he he pardoned him and said, "Go and sin no more." You know, Andrew Jackson forgives sin. Right. Okay. Yeah, I said that wasn't exactly what he said, but um, but show that you know instead of seeking you know complete destruction of the people that did Fort Mims, he was willing to forgive the leader. What was in the mid 1700s? There's Indians in like the New York State area went on a rampage and tried to wipe all the English and settlers. And they, this ferocity of the Hamas attack in one of that yeah. they even Pontiacs, of uh, course, that you're talking about? Might have been. It was like King Somebody's War. And well, was King, Phil, King Philip's King, War. King, War yeah. And uh, they even killed the cattle. I mean, they were that. And and they were wiped out. Yeah, they were wiped out. Well, all right. I'm going to get us on back on to uh, the Yom Kippur War. I'm going to look at five aspects. One is you can't talk about Yom Kippur without thinking about 1967 because 1967 is the shadow that hangs over this war. It hangs over it for two reasons. One, the Arabs were humiliated. Uh, they were humiliated in 56. They were humiliated in 48. In 1967, they were really humiliated. And it wasn't just that they were routed and defeated in six days. It's that they turned and ran. And so that they they saw they needed to redeem their own cowardice, uh, their own failures, and that they needed to uh, regain honor. And that is going to be the big motivation or a significant motivation for the Arabs. It's the opposite for the Israelis. The Israelis had never felt security. In the years after 1967, there be, they began to develop a kind of hubristic, those guys can't fight with us. They're afraid of us. They know if they meet, if we meet on the battlefield, we're going to push them around again. They won't dare attack us. Uh, and if they do, we'll handle it and we'll handle it easily. And they began to feel, invincible is too strong a word, but to some degree, like, we're, we're, not, we're not the scared little, small country in the middle of an Arab world here. We can take these guys, we can handle ourselves here. And that's a major, major, and that's gonna get shattered here. The first three or four days of the war, um, Israel is on the defensive. They are not winning this war. As a matter of fact, there are four or five occasions where it is possible that the Arabs can win decisively and end the war pretty much the way the six day war had ended. So that's a big deal. Number two, um, that should be for change numbers. You've heard the phrase victory disease. No. Uh, it was coined by a Jap Japanese admiral I think, uh, after the successes, the first mm -hmm. couple of months after Pearl Harbor, that they just developed this overwhelming. Yep. We can't lose. And, and we, but, still we have to think. but it was a thing that Israel was not used to having a feeling of security. Because, I mean, if we're talking about in, in 1973, the time of this war, there's 80 million Arabs and there's 3 million Israelis. That's an overwhelming advantage. And if you look at economics, they've got the oil. If you look at war materials, they're 8, 10 to 1 ratio, what the, um, what the um, uh, Israelis have. The other thing that is, is central to this is the Cold War begins to insert itself in 1956 in the Suez crisis. But in 1973, it's there. The One of the things that we will learn in this is that the Israelis were utterly and completely dependent on the United States for supplies. One of the things you have to realize when you're talking about Israel is that they are a country of 3 million. <clears throat> they do not have the economy to support any prolonged war or to pay for all of the military equipment, planes, tanks, missiles, even to develop them. They can't do it. And if the United States is not gonna feed them these things, they're not gonna make it. At the same time, on the other hand, Egypt and Syria are, are better equipped than Israel to produce, but not 
to match what the United States could feed to Israel. And the Arabs are being fed by the Soviet Union. Uh, almost all of their equipment is from Russia. And so this is now, if we didn't realize it was a proxy, the Middle East was a proxy for the Cold War. By the end of the Yom Kippur War, we know it. Uh, the third thing is... Excuse me, why on this one? When did the United States start supporting Israel? And when did the Soviet Union start supporting the Arabs? Uh, it, it is a complicated answer for the United States. LBJ was the most supportive president of Israel of any president in our history. Nixon was the opposite. Post Yom Kippur, um, uh, because of events, um, uh, the United States is going to be Israel's best friend in terms of supplying them. And it is post-1967 that uh, the Soviet Union becomes the supporter of the Arabs in a major way. So Soviet started supporting the Arabs the same time LBJ started supporting mm -hmm. Israel. But Nixon Trying reverses. I, I read in Michael Burns' book that uh, it was about three days after the war began that Nixon finally relented and started sending aid to Israel. And and the, and the real answer, and, and that's not quite 100% accurate, but the real answer there is Henry Kissinger uh, negotiated that. Okay, I mean, but, yeah, right. About three no. days after it's in short and, that day. We're going to get into that. It's okay. a more complicated story than that. Okay. okay. And, and I think in 73, a lot of the Air, Israeli Air Force was French planes. You know, they had some sort of alliance with the French, not 56, well, not just 56, but the French were helping them develop their nuclear weapons. Yes. And France declared prior to the war, hey, hello, prior to the war, that they were not going to sell Israel any more planes, which makes... Israel 100% reliant on, on America for that. France, that's going to be another big story in here. Um, I'm not going to focus on military history, but um, one of the things I'm going to look at is uh, Israel's rapid mobilization. Um, I, I think I didn't say the failure of, of Israeli intelligence. That is really key here. Um, Israeli intelligence had bragged that they would know at least six days before any attack that the attack was coming. Um, they had they gave them barely six hours warning, uh, and and Israel has to mobilize. Now you have to understand this is a population of three million people. Okay, the mobilization is of about three hundred fifty thousand. That's about eleven percent of the population. It's also a much greater percentage of the economy, because in the three million you've got kids, you've got old people. Um, you've got women who are not in the uh, formal economy uh, at this stage still, although, you know, that obviously is, there are a larger and larger share of that. Uh, so as a percentage of the economy, for them to mobilize, the economy doesn't stand still, but it comes pretty damn close. If you're going to pull that many people suddenly and abruptly out of um, uh, production, it changes things. Uh, again, I'm not going to focus on military history, but I am going to focus on how this war was different from 67. And in particular, uh, there's one, one element here, which is um, in 67, um, Israel had a preemptive strike. They do not get that preemptive strike here. And that's going to be a central part of the story. Uh, and the last thing we're going to look at in 1973, as this war is, they're, they're trying to create the ceasefire. There is a moment, a moment meaning two or three days, in which the Soviets were threatening because they were unhappy with the United States not controlling Israel during the ceasefire, that they were going to send in their own troops and they were going to straighten things out. And then the United States were saying, they're going to send in troops, we'll send in troops. And they declared DEFCON 3, which is uh, an alert status that says we're in the war preparation stage. So this very nearly, it didn't get there, but very nearly became uh, a conflict between the two superpowers. And, you know, we said this was a Cold War proxy. It almost became, forget proxy, uh, the two big guns are going to come at and go at it here at the same time. And there you always get the fear of nuclear power. Uh, and remember, Israel has a nuclear bomb. And at one point, 
uh, Moisha Diane in the first four days because they are losing by every measurable uh, metric uh, that uh, there's a staff meeting and Moisha Diane says to go to my ear and all of the generals, get the, uh, we need to get the uh, nuclear bomb out and prepared in case we are going to use it. And go to my ear tells him no. But he, uh, I, he was afraid for the very survival of Israel. And he said, if, if, if it's a question of uh, Israel's survival, pull out the nuclear bomb. So this was closer to that threat than probably any time since 1962. All right, I'm gonna very quickly go over um, the shadow of 1967, because I think we've already talked about it. And again, please, anybody at any point, if you have an opinion or a thought, interrupt. Um, it, um, uh, Michael, could you just give a date of uh, the Yom Kippur War? I October mean, 6th, 1973. Okay. Yeah, because you, you've talked about three wars. 1948 okay. was the war uh, just after uh, Israel established itself, uh, declared itself a nation, uh, was recognized by the United States and the Soviet Union, and uh, all the Ar five Arab nations got together and attacked them, thinking they were going to... Uh, okay, okay, that's all I'm... Uh, 1948. Okay. Then, then, what, then, Suez. then what's the next one? 56, the Suez canal crisis. Okay. And then we get to 67. Okay. And then 73. And 73 is the wrong... What, the the wrong. The wrong. Okay. That's where we are. And are you, did you attribute that one failure of intelligence? Or yes. I, I mean, you're you're talking about so many things that I can't. 1973 is the failure of intelligence. Okay. In 1967, the intelligence was perfect. They knew what was going to happen. They even had uh, Egypt's war plans. They had a copy of them. And uh, that's when they launched their preemptive strike and were able to, uh, uh, that's going to. Uh, I think in both 56 and 67, Israel attacked first. Yes. Which gave them the jump to what capture the Sinai. Okay. Um, again, just very, very quickly, in terms of the shadow of 1967, it is the absolute humiliation of the Arab countries, Egypt and Syria in particular, uh, but the Arab nations in, in total, they were easily handled by the Israeli military. Uh, and, and they were ashamed because not only did they get defeated, but they ran. You know, a retreat, retreat turned into a rout, and they needed to avenge not what Israel did to them, but what they did to themselves. Uh, they saw themselves as having behaved cowardly and that they could not allow that stain to remain on their character. They had to take on Israel one more time. Um, and then the Israeli hubris, um, thinking that, you know what, whatever they throw at us, we can beat them. There's a moment in this war, and I don't do military history, but there's a moment in the Golan Heights where uh, a, an Israeli general is being sent, a, a tank division leader is being sent to uh, confront uh, an uh, Assyrian tank division. The Israelis have 100 tanks. The Syrians have 800. And the general uses for a second, says 100 to 800. That's good enough. We can take them. Um, that kind of, and, and mind you, they're going to knock out four and five and six and eight tanks to everyone they lose, and sometimes more, higher ratios than that. But if this is going to be a war of attrition, they can't win that war. They need to happen here, what happened in 67, which is that the Syrians and the Egyptians won. Uh, and that's not going to happen here. Now, this gets down to what were Sadat's war plans. Sadat did not want to defeat Israel. He did not want to destroy them and remove them from the planet. He did not want to force them back to pre-1967 um, boundaries and all the occupied territories given back. He wanted to restore, restore Egyptian honor. He had SAMS missiles that would give them protection for a seven mile radius beyond the canal. He wanted to take seven miles, take it decisively, and then call for a ceasefire and say, thump our chests, we pushed you around. 
And now let's get down to the negotiating how we're going to work out this peace. Syria, on the other hand, wanted to destroy Israel, wanted to go back to the pre-1948 pre uh, Middle East. Uh, but Sadat very, very plainly lied to Assad, the leader of Syria, because Assad was saying, you're, you're going to keep coming, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to keep coming here. He never had intentions of doing that. He simply wanted to have enough of a victory to say, we can, we've moved the shame, we're there. Um, and that's a, that is a, again, I said that was one of the biggest motivations. Um, for the Israelis, the big outcome of this war is that their, their sense of invincibility and security were going to be shaken, were going to be shattered. And, and that is a major thing. I want to focus on, on, on one element of military history, and that is that preemptive strike. And I want to go back to 1967 first. The preemptive strike, you know, we call this the Six Day War. In fact, we could call it the Eight Day, Eight Hour War, because it really was won in the first eight hours. Israel launched a preemptive air attack. They flew over the canal into Egypt and wiped out 80% of Egyptian Air Force and didn't lose one plane. Then they turned around, and, and mind you, they have such a small Air Force, that took three waves. One, come back and refuel. Two, come back and refuel. Three, come back and refuel. But they caught the Egyptians completely off guard. It was Pearl Harbor on steroids. And they, they literally destroyed the Air Force and then turned around and did it to Syria. For the rest of the six-day war, Israel controlled the skies entirely, which meant they could fly over and into Egypt, basically unimpeded, and bomb sites there. They could fly into Damascus and bomb there with basically no opposition. If a tank division was in a difficult struggle, they could fly to the aid of the uh, tank division. Um, they could also just go on attacks against the tank divisions on their own. They had the freedom for that Air Force to do whatever it wanted, and they lost very few planes in that entire war. Um, that's the key. That's where they wanted. Everything else was the mop-up. Um, you could also call it the four-day war, because after four days, Egypt quit. Egypt cried uncle and ran. And the reasons it's a six-day war, Syria was just a little more stubborn. saying, like, we don't quit. So they turned around now, one front war, and went to Syria, and in two days, Syria said, that's enough. So, uh, again, I think <coughs> you could literally call this the eight-hour war, <coughs> because they really had it. Nothing else made the significant difference in the Six-Day War like those first eight hours. So the question is, why don't they do it again? I know they only had six hours warning, but they, there had been talk already um, that there might be, there could be, and intelligence agencies, which Amman is their major intelligence agency, were saying, don't worry, it's not going to happen. But nonetheless, um, the eyeball test would tell you. If you look at uh, the west side of uh, the Suez Canal, they had three and four times as number of Egyptian soldiers mobilized there. Something's going on. So you had to have at least an inkling that it was possible. The reason they didn't was the United States. Henry Kissinger, in discussions with Bolton Meyer, said, do not, do not have a preemptive strike. Do not be the first. They attack you and then you <laughs> If you attack first, the world is going to uh, turn against you and say it's your fault. You started this, you will not be able to give you the support you need. Uh, and uh, the Israeli um, military leaders were all saying to Golda, we need the preemptive strike. And she said, <laughs> things that we've been saying again and again here. It's not the capability of the Israeli army, 
It's the supplies. They know, even if they do everything perfectly, they are going to need to be supplied by the United States. And if the United States is not resupplying them, they're going to lose. As a matter of fact, in the Six-Day War, at the end of those six days, Israel was almost out of ammo and shells, and uh, the number of tanks they had was not enough. The number of planes they had, again, it's a small air force, uh, was not enough. If the war had gone on for about another week and there had been no resupplying by the United States, we could be talking about some very different circumstances uh, at the end of the Six Day War. It could indeed turn into either a stalemate or an Arab victory. Um, yeah, the, the key of supplies, and I mean, if you <laughs> about the United States, uh, let's go back to Pearl Harbor here. Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Why? They want to disable and cripple our Navy so that we will not be able to uh, launch for some significant period of time any military naval efforts into the Pacific. And in point of fact, most importantly, um, they were afraid that the United States Navy could cut their um, line to uh, oil. And uh, Japan has no oil on its own. If you cut their oil supply, they're in big trouble. The problem is... A, they didn't cripple to the degree that the Israeli Air Force uh, was able to cripple the Egyptian and Syrian Air Forces. But America's capacity to turn around and produce is, we're a giant on that behalf. I mean, if you think about, if you tried to say, what was America's greatest contribution to World War II? It's not our soldiers. It's our industry that produced mm -hmm. tanks and planes and everything yeah. imaginable that you needed. I remember reading a statistic, and I don't remember them exactly, but ballpark, I can tell you that when America got officially into the war, uh, a country like England was able to produce like one and a half tanks a month and two airplanes. In our first week of production, we were producing hundreds of each. I mean, just on a scale that just blows every other nation out of, out of the water. And so that Pearl Harbor ultimately is not the success that the Japanese want it to be because even had they destroyed more of our Navy than they were able to, we could have recreated it in a, a more rapid time period than Japan would have been expecting. Um, Israel is not that economy. Uh, they're not that economy today. If you think about all the things we're hearing on the news today, about America's involvement uh, and support of Israel. The most important thing they keep talking about is the Iron Dome, which is that defense system that intercepts uh, Hamas rockets from uh, Hamas. Israel can't produce that on its own. If we were not providing that, those stories that we heard about the first day with all the, the deaths, we'd be hearing five and six and eight more stories of that type. Uh, Israel, then and now, is dependent on the United States for the, those military supplies. Um, and so they didn't uh, have the preemptive strike because we told them not to. They also didn't because of the, um, uh, the, the failure of intelligence. And, and, and this is a central story here, uh, a name that maybe most of us don't know. I didn't know. His name is General and I'm going to mispronounce it probably, Zaire. It's Z-E-I-R-E, Z-E-I-R-E. -E. He was in charge of um, basically the military intelligence and that it was his specific one to say, um, are the Egyptians, and the Egyptians are the ones they're concerned about, not the Syrians, are the Egyptians going to attack? He consistently said no and said it with confidence. And people believed him because there had been many false reports. They're going to attack tomorrow. And it didn't happen. And it didn't happen. So now when he said, no, these are false, false reports. It's not going to happen. They were willing to believe him. Uh, and also because they were afraid, this is relating to Kissinger conversation, if they did a mobilization and a big military buildup and came to the edge of the canal, much of the world would have said, ah, they're trying to provoke a war. 
And so they didn't want to have that appearance. But it's not just that you could do the eye test and see how many soldiers Egypt was mobilizing. Um, it was Ramadan. And Ramadan involves some severe strict fasting on the part of Muslims. And the Egyptian soldiers were being told, uh, you do not have to uh, follow those fasts. Wait a minute. This is an important part of their religious behaviors. To stop the Ramadan fast was significant. Soviets were pulling, were airlifting all of their families out of Egypt and Syria. Why are they doing that? Do they know something? Yes, they do. They know there's going to be an attack. King Hussein of Jordan came to Golda Meir's office and said, I can't tell you the exact date, but this one's real. There will be a war. Golda Meir goes to her, General Deira, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, uh, and says, this is the word I'm getting from King Hussein. And he says, um, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. I'm guaranteeing you it's not going to happen. Now, there's also one other source, well, two other sources. The one is a man named Marwan. Marwan is the son-in-law of Nasser, who has died, and he is Anwar Sadat's right-hand man. And from all accounts, he is a man of no character who just likes money and the things money can do. So he goes to the Israelis, this is four or five years, it's after the 67 war, and says, I want you to pay me a lot of money and I'm going to give you information you couldn't get anywhere and you're going to love me. And time after time, he gave information. It was right. They would corroborate it. He was right. He was right. He was right. He was right. Two days before. Now, that's not six days like uh, uh, Zara had promised. But two days before, he said, it's coming and it's real. Zaire never passes that information along. Hmm. He doesn't tell Golda. He doesn't tell Moisha Diane. He doesn't tell General Elazar, who is the commander of all the troops, because he is damn sure it's not going to happen. Hmm. And you know, and and that that's that stubbornness and hubris that comes in here is is a big problem. Um, why doesn't he believe it? Or what what allows him to? Because I mean, this is dangerous. The very survival of Israel would be at stake. And his answer. <laughs> Excuse me, is something that in Israel is called the concept. Israel had devices planted in Egypt, which they called extraordinary measures. They were basically just bugs that could record conversations, but that Egypt and Syria didn't know about, mainly in Egypt. Um, and that he used sparingly, because this is 1973, these were battery operated. And therefore, if you use them too much, somebody had to go back into, into Egypt in a very dangerous mission and uh, uh, put another battery in. So he didn't want to use that. But years before, they had taped a conversation of Anwar Sadat's. And Sadat said, and, and this is what Israel came, Zaira and Israel in gen, intelligence in general came to believe. Dot said very clearly, Syria will never go to war unless Egypt is going. They won't go on their own. Okay, that tells Israeli intelligence, focus on Egypt. Don't worry about Syria. Okay, that's right. Two, we will not go to war until we have enough Russian planes, Scud missiles, SAMs, etc., that we can match them and, and negate their air force, because he knows it was their air force that defeated them in the first eight hours of the 67 war. And Russia, Soviet Union, has promised a lot of these, this equipment, but it will be delivered within the next two years. And then there's training needed. So Dara is saying essentially, they may be gearing up for war, but the war is going to be in 75 or maybe 76. We don't need to worry in 73. And uh, they were just dead wrong. 
and his failure to pass along Marwan's information. Uh, and then he lied. He lied about extraordinary measures. Um, Diane had gone to him and said, all right, you know, you've got your information. Use extraordinary the extraordinary measures. We want to tape these people and know what's going on. He turns on the extraordinary measures just to test them at midnight and turns them off at five o'clock in the morning. Not the most likely time to get taped conversations. And when asked, are you using the extraordinary measures? He said, oh yeah, of course. He wasn't. He didn't want to chance their being discovered. Uh, and uh, he didn't believe they would provide any information that would be useful. And he never told anyone. Uh, if anybody has seen the movie Golda, um, that they bring that up in that movie where Golda is told, they never used the extraordinary measures. They kept this secret. They lied to us. And she says, well, we're never going to let you know this. We're going to keep this to ourselves because it's, it's too awful. But on that basis, um, they are not going to get um, the pre-warning that they could very easily have gotten if the extraordinary measures had been used. They did not use what was available to them. And there ultimately is no real excuse for it. That his job is to collect intelligence and to use the best resources that you have to do that. And he did not. Um, and so the end result is uh, that Israel is caught with about six hours warning, which is not enough. Um, and then we get into the problem of mobilization. It is Yom Kippur. Okay, here's how mobilization, here, here's the Israeli military service system. Every male at this point, now it's men and women, but then it was just men had to give three years of military service. At the end of those three years, you were put into the reserves and you stayed in the reserves until your mid forties. And then um, once a month, oh, oh, I'm sorry, at least once a year, but I'm not sure of the time. You, you would periodically during the year be called in for training and exercises just to keep your hand in. Now for mobilization, uh, what you would do is, and you've got to mobilize about 350,000 people. That's a big job. Okay, how do you do that? Um, you go on radio and you go on TV and say, mobilization in, in process. Everybody from unit, da, 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 da. And you give names and you give uh, divisions, et cetera. Report immediately. Jam Kapoor. Radio and television are turned off. There are no radio and television broadcast. People are not listening to or watching either of those. They are either at home or they're at the synagogue. And so what do you do? People drive out door to door. And if they're not there, then they go to the synagogue. You know, and it, it snowballs and builds. After a while, people are beginning to realize, but it's a slow, slower process. It's going to take about two and a half days to mobilize. With six days warning, they could have been mobilized and ready. The result is the first three or four days where the Arabs are on the uh, offensive and are winning, however we define winning, um, the Israeli soldiers are not getting a break, they're not getting sleep. Uh, the reserves have to come in and have to come in soon. Uh, but for at least two and a half days, it's only that original small 100,000 uh, soldiers that are available for the fight. The 350,000, they have not arrived and will not arrive for a little while. Besides which, mobilization doesn't mean just mobilizing people. The tanks, uh, the, some of them, they've been working on them, repairing them, or they've lent them to some other base. Or, you got to recollect all the material, all the planes, all the tanks. A lot of people are, but one of the generals who was mobilized uh, borrowed a, uh, a van from one of the local businesses to drive to go to, to uh, his base to get started. And there are thousands of stories like that. So mobilization was 
overly slow for the what would be normal for uh, an Israeli mobilization. Um, and uh, again, uh, that that created created problems. Okay, now again, I'm not a military person. I'm, but I'm going to mention three things that changed this war also beyond the, not, the lack of a preemptive strike. One is the Egyptians were being supplied with arms that they never possessed in the Six Day War. The primary one of those are SAMs. SAMs are surface to air missiles, and they fly three times faster than any Israeli plane. And they can, relatively speaking, negate uh, the power the impact of the Israeli Air Force. Uh, I, I mentioned when they tried to do a, a strike on the Egyptian airfields, they lost 10% of their planes the first wave. That is not sustainable. Um, uh, even if the United States is going to resupply you, how fast do those resupplies happen? You can't lose 10% every time you go out. Um, so those and same... Not just planes uh, and, 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 enormous amount of those cases the pilots were able to actually get back, get back and the planes yeah. some of some of the planes were able to be repaired a, a significant percentage but yes they did did they lose some pilots too yes um but planes were disabled and might be three days to fix or something like that so it was same thing with tanks a lot of tanks were disabled but they dragged them back and they repaired them um okay uh, then there's another thing called cyber missiles. If you said the second thing that made the Six Day War uh, such a great victory for the Israelis, um, it was tank warfare. They outmaneuvered uh, the Egyptian tank divisions and the Syrian tank divisions significantly. Cyber missiles are also Russian, and they are portable. One man can carry it. So an infantryman, you don't have to be, normally it was a tank shooting at a tank. An infantryman could carry on his shoulder a Sager missile, plan himself down, and, and actually, uh, it's a weird thing, they had wire, that mile-long wire that extended from the, uh, um, from the missile, and using a joystick, he could direct that missile to go wherever he wanted. If the tank moved left, he could move left or right or whatever. Uh, and and it was devastating. The, the uh, the Israelis were losing more tanks in the in the first days of battle than they were in the Six Day War, uh, so that was a big one. And the other is Egypt had Scud missiles. They had a limited amount, but Scud missiles meant that you could fire into Israeli territory and bomb Tel Aviv or Haifa or wherever it might be, whatever target you pick. That meant that the Israeli Air Force, instead of being aggressive, had to be some hanging back. To intercept the Scud missiles, so all of those technical military armament changes um, made the Arab military much more daunting uh, to defeat than in the Six Day War. I think also had something because after the Six Day War, the Suez Canal separated both sides. They had something to get across the canal too. I can't remember exactly what not not precisely. Um, in in the in the uh, and this is this is going to be a big deal here. The turning point in the war is Israel is going to cross the canal. To begin the war, Egypt crosses the canal. In the night, they put together these um, quick. They call them bridge tanks that literally build bridges uh, across the Suez, and then they came across. Um, Israel would have to build their own bridges to get back to get over. To Egypt, and that was a monumental task, uh, not something that's just quick and easy. Uh, and so uh, that's, but when they get in, now they're fighting the war on Egyptian territory, and that changes the war considerably. Um, and then I mentioned to you, uh, I didn't call it by name, Operation Tagar, which was the Egyptian, I'm sorry, the Israeli plan to bomb the Egyptian airfields. They sent their first wave out. They came back to refuel, and things were going badly in against Syria in the Golan Heights, and the generals decided, stop where you are, turn around and fly to Syria. 
And so whatever, even if they had been able to be to successfully complete this, they might have crippled much of the Egyptian Air Force. But that never happened. Okay. The last, the two other changes that are different, make a difference between 1967 and uh, 1973, the Yom Kippur War, is outside of 19, the beginnings of the 1948 war, Israel had never fought a defensive war. They were on the offensive right from the start and very effectively so. And the Arabs were on the defensive and being pushed back and being pushed back. Egypt spent about three or four days on the defensive. And psychologically, that just felt wrong to them. Wait a minute. We're supposed to be the guys pushing them around and they're pushing us around a bit too much. Now, there are are there are some heroes in here and I, and I want to mention a couple of them. There's a man named uh, Zvika uh, what was his name? <coughs> Probably have it down here. But, uh, Zvika Greengold. I do have it written down. Uh, he was not a general. He was a low-ranking soldier. He was out in his tank and he was solo. In the battle for the, uh, the Golan Heights, the most important thing that the Israelis had to do was to defend the base at a, 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 a town called Nafak. N-A-F-A-K-H, Nafak. I don't know that I'm pronouncing it correctly. He was out there at night, he was alone, and he, literally held, he was, he, he came into a division that was heading towards the fire. And he literally, he, it's very dark. He shot one tank, disabled it, moved his position, shot another tank from another position. They thought he was more than one person, more than one tank. And he stopped about 15 tanks and the Arabs backed off and retrenched instead of going to Nafak. The only, de only defense between the Arabs and Nafak was one tank. And Zavika became a cultural hero in Israel. Uh, <laughs> it was a, a, a mantra, for Zavika. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of those weird things that, that wars can turn. This one man in a tank, uh, he stopped a division. And if, if he had not, and they had plowed on through against no opposition to Nafak. Uh, again, we could be talking about a very different outcome for this war. Um, the other person to talk about, and, and he's he's a difficult one to talk about, is Ariel Sharon. Most of us know him because he became prime minister. He was maybe, if I was gonna compare him to anybody, Maybe to General Patton. He's going to say the same thing. Yeah. He was a guy, in, the, in I read two books on this war. At least six different occasions, generals were calling the, the Moshe Diane and Golda Meir and saying, court martial this guy or dismiss him from the army. Dismiss him from the army. We can't deal with him. Get him out of here. <laughs> Why? Because if you gave him an order, and he didn't think it was the right order. He'd say, no, 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 that's a stupid plan. I got a better plan. Yes, but we outrank you. We want you to go to this hill. No, that's the wrong place to go. I'm not going there. This is where I need to go. And he would not obey them. And then he would go where he decided to go. Uh, and again, at least six occasions. It could be more than that. The leadership of uh, General Elazar and, and all the and Golden Age, they were discussing, do we need to take these guys, this guy out of commission? But we said the turning point of the war was the crossing. He was ordered not to cross. And he said, we've got to. It's the right plan. It's the only thing that will work. No, we want you to wait. We're going to bring more divisions up. We're going to. No, you go now. They can see us. If, if we wait. And he went. Well, I'm saying he didn't go. He sent 30 of his tanks across. 
uh, and began what would be the movement that would actually turn the war around entirely. And one of the reasons that they did not court martial him and did not dismiss him is they all knew if the impossible had to be done, he was the guy most likely to do it. He would also remind me a little bit of Stonewall Jackson. Again, he would do the daring, do the thing that nobody would say he can do, and then he'd pull it off. Now, part of why they didn't like him is he was also a press hound. He'd love to have journalists around taking pictures of him while he was doing heroic things. And he was a grandstander, and that irked a lot of people. All of those things were true. But he was also very good at what he had to do. Uh, and, and they knew they needed him there. So uh, anybody else would have been court-martialed. And it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have taken six tries. He would have been the first time. You disobeyed an order, you're out. We got you. But... He was also a hero in uh, 56. He was also a hero in 48. And that's one of the things about the Israeli army that is always very interesting. Most armies, um, uh, Kurt Vonnegut wrote a book um, and the subtitle was uh, The, the uh, Children's Crusade. Because in wars, it's 18 year olds we send to fight. In the Israeli army, you've got 18 year olds. They're part of the doing their three year service. And then you've got 45 year olds and you've got every age in between. So when you mobilize uh, these reserves, they're really experienced. Some of them are really good at their job and, uh, and they don't need training or they walk in and they're ready to go. As a matter of fact, in many cases, they'll walk in and the general will say, we're trying to do this. And uh, the reservists who came up said, no, 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 here's a better plan. I know this terrain. And he'd redirect the generals and they'd listen to them because they were very, very good. Again, Sharon didn't try to get people to listen to him. He told them, I'm right, you're wrong. This is what we got to do. This is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do. And you can't run an army like that. But you need people like Ariel Sharon if you're going to win. And so it's, um, it's one of those very, very difficult, difficult, difficult situations. Um, a special note. I, remember, I watched the movie Golda with, with my wife, Rosanna. And one of the things I said, as I, I questioned it, it was they showed Moisha Diane in a, a very negative, weak light. And all my images of Moisha Diane with his patch and everything was he was braver than the bravest of the brave. And he was actually acting depressed and somewhat cowardly. And I said to Rosanna, I don't, I don't, is that true? In both books, it says Moshe Diane, in the words of some, was having meltdowns, and in the words of others, was having a, a nervous breakdown. But the pressure of losing was getting to him. Uh, you know, I guess in the Six Day War, he didn't have time to get depressed. In the Forty Eight War, that was pretty quick too. Uh, but he was actually Goldemeyer had to keep him away from the press. Uh, because he was sending negative messages out there. Um, he was very clearly convinced by day four they were going to lose the war. And that's when he suggested bringing out the loops. Um, because he said, yeah, basically, if we're going down, ah, we bring out the big guns and we use them. Um, when I saw the movie, I thought he'd be a better subject for a movie. But it just is always be wrong or whatever. Um, and you know, Golda was, was listening to him at least at the start because he was the hero of the past wars, and and it just it just seemed like well, he was just doing everything wrong. Yeah, and it just seemed like what what's going on with that? Yeah, I, I mean, and it surprised me again. One of the thing, interesting things about doing this forum is I lived through this stuff, but I have my impressions of the history, not necessarily. Um, any significant knowledge. And I just assumed the persona for Christian Diane because it's how he presented himself to the world, at least in the images that I saw. And uh, I, I questioned it in the movie and then my reading said, yeah, this was what was going on. Uh, this was, uh, uh, they, uh, the Israelis had an expression, the third temple. 
Um, the Romans destroyed the first temple. The Babylonians destroyed the first temple. Uh, the Romans destroyed the second temple. And Israel itself, a, a newly formed nation, considered themselves in their entirety the third temple. And he was saying to his soldiers, and this is a, that's a phrase that is very evocative for Israelis, this may be the end of the third temple. You can't, I mean, you can't say that. It, it may be true, but you can't say that. Not if you're the leader who is supposed to be motivating them to go out and defend Israel. And uh, uh, again, I, it's one of those things where I was surprised. Now, we're getting to the, the bridges that we were talking about. The turning point... The, the, the turning point of the war is the crossing of the Suez Canal. Um, in the Suez Canal, you need to build a bridge there. The Israelis had three options. They had what they call the rolling bridge. It was a ready-built 450-ton bridge that they, if they could drive it 100 miles or so and bring it to the uh, Suez Canal, you plunk it in and you got a bridge. But they're going across the desert and, and and it broke a few times and tanks broke down and that's an almost impossible task. They eventually do get there, but very late in the game. The second is what are called pontoon bridges, and they are partial bridges, pieces of bridges. This is like a fabricated house. You drive there, they're still big, but not nearly as big as the rolling bridge. You drive them to the canal, put them in the water, and connect them, and you build a bridge in pieces and sections. Uh, that will get there before the rolling bridge. That's what they did. Indeed. Yep, absolutely. Uh, but it's a massive operation. Mm -hmm. uh, and U.S. military has more resources yeah, but, than the... Uh, yeah, but they had... Yeah, yes, they had, uh, absolutely. And the third thing they had are what they call crocodiles. And the closest thing I can give you to explain what crocodiles are, and they are the heroes of this story, they're like those duck boats that can go on land and they go into the water and a little larger than the duck boats and they could ferry the tanks across. That's what um, Sharon used. They bought them on the cheap for $5,000. And when we're talking military equipment, $5,000 is a penny. And that's what he used to get them across. Um, then pontoons arrived and they were able to rebuild a, a bridge there. And then ultimately uh, the rolling bridge arrived and they were able to get that up. And so they could increase the flow across. But um, uh, you just look at that history and you say, how many places could it have gone wrong? And uh, so many. What I want to talk about now is the relationship between Israel and the United States. If you said to somebody, what is the relationship between Israel and the United States? <laughs> in their staunchest supporters from 1948 on, we were their saviors on many an occasion, and the relationship was always a close knit. Uh, they are our best friends, and we are their best friends. It's not true. In 1948, who supplied Israel with its tanks and planes? Stalin. That's a shocker to me. The United States did not. In 1956, we came in because we were angry at them for their collusion with the French and the British over the Suez Canal. And we were basically telling them, get back in line and do what you're told. I mean, essentially, we spanked them. Kennedy was much better in terms of his relationship. Nobody <laughs> quite understands why. But LBJ opened up the floodgates uh, and he gave them, I mean, he was the most generous president to the Israelis, um, uh, probably still in our history. I mean, monetary amounts, we've given more now because uh, the relationship has been established that way. And then we get to Nixon. And if anybody has listened to any excerpts of the tapes, they are rife with anti-Semitic remarks. And he used to refer to uh, Kedger as his Jew. Um, and we were mentioning earlier about the French. The French had been major suppliers of military equipment to Israel. 
Prince got angry. I don't really know what the basis for the anger was, but they got angry. They said, no more sales. They cut them off completely. They canceled sales that were already in, in on order. Uh, George Pompidou was the president of France at this time. And he comes to the United States for a meeting with Nixon. And at this point, Nixon is going through Watergate. Uh, things are going really, really badly. He's drinking too heavily. He wants this to be one of those pomp and circumstance moments where he looks presidential uh, in front of the world, that he looks statesmanlike. The, Israel, the <laughs> American Jews led a whole series of protests against Pompidou the whole time he was in America, pissing Pompidou off no end. And one of the major things they did, there's a, a scandal in France called the uh, Markovich scandal. And it had to deal with Alain Delon and some monsters involved and somebody got killed in this car. And in the car where the murder took place, George Pompidou's wife had been, and they had explicit pictures of her having sex. And the Israelis were yelling vulgar things at Pompidou about his wife and all of that, and Pompidou was ready to stomp off and just leave. And Nixon was furious. They spoiled his um, photo op. And so it, when, when Golda Meir was asking, <laughs> no, no, no. We have already said last month that Nixon was a bit MIA. Nowhere was he more MIA than in the Yom Kippur War and its negotiations. He was drinking rather heavily. Golda Meir was making her calls directly to Henry Kissinger and saying, Henry, we're not going to win this war. We don't have the materiel. We need tanks, planes, shells, missiles anything and everything you can give us. And he's hemming and hawing. I don't think we can do that for you, Golda. And she pushes. I think Golda Meir is an underrated prime minister. Um, she made very hard decisions and she pushed and got Kissinger finally to agree. But here's the problem. A day matters in, a, in this war. Two days really matter. What happens is um, uh, Kissinger delays sending it two days and then he is agreeing to send it now. He's formalized it. It's all the, all the paperwork's done and Israel has crossed over into Egypt. They've crossed the Suez and the Soviets and the Egyptians not the Syrians are yelling for a ceasefire and that's perfect for Kissinger. That's exactly what he wants. We said this last time and I know it sounds crazy. Kissinger did not want Israel to win. Kissinger did not want the Arabs to win. He wanted a stalemate where they could control the terms of the peace settlement. If one side is winning, it changes the dynamics. And the, and the other thing you have to realize is Kissinger has two goals here. One, he would like to help uh, Israel, and he certainly would like to guarantee their survival. But he also wants the Arabs. And when we say Arabs in this context, we mean Saudis. He wants the Saudis not to be offended because we need their oil. Our Western allies need their oil. Uh, we need to keep them happy. So if we can stop this war at a moment where we've helped Israel survive, but we've stopped them from actually overrunning the Egyptian army and winning, um, the balance that might keep both sides happy. Israelis happy with him. American Jews happy with the administration and the Arabs not upset or not overly upset. Well, Kissinger was always interested in orderly outcomes. He was looking for balance, absolutely, all the time, all the time. Now, so, yeah. There were some Saudi troops that were sent to the Syrian front, right? Don't think so. There were some very small number. Very, there were some Jordanian troops, very small number, and Iraqis sent some. Maybe the Saudis sent a few, but not. You're right; it's a very small number. Yeah. Some that's not been mentioned, but I think it had a terrible, I mean, a tremendous psychological effect. Would you say with how they did their West 
they remembered the 1972 Munich massacre. Yeah. And whatever that just gave Sharon and all that, the, the gumption and everything else to. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm glad you said that because one of the things I am thinking of, there are so many things that we have missed in the 70s that I might do another season where we fill in and the Munich uh, Olympics are part of that. Okay. Because they were embarrassed by that. Oh. And, 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 yes. You know, the, the Germans agreed with them to do the, the security and what they wanted to do and taking it out of their hands. Yeah. And so when this came around, it was time to punch. Okay. Um, Kissinger gets the ceasefire call. The Israelis are upset. They know they are within a couple of days of actually routing the Egyptian army. If they, if this can go two or three more days, they think they will get to the bargaining table with some serious leverage. Um, and uh, they do manage to delay the ceasefire going into place by a couple of days, but that's still not enough. Uh, and then they ignore it. Now, this is where the story gets, to me, frightening and something very important for us to realize. Um, Israel is ignoring the ceasefire. The Egyptians are being pushed and almost routed and they're saying, you've got to stop this, we promised. Uh, and Kissinger is trying to get them to stop, but nobody's listening. The Soviet Union is responding very angrily. I also want to point out, this is a story that has only come out in the last, say, five years. We talk about um, Nixon being missing in action, something I never knew, but it was in both of the books that I read. Brezhnev was a bit MIA. Uh, he was the leader of the Soviet Union at that moment. Uh, he was addicted to um, sleeping pills. And then he would drink alcohol. And in the combination, he would get very erratic and very irrational. And he started screaming things like, send a, send a thousand or 10,000 Soviet troops in. Bring out the, nuke, the, the nukes. I mean, he was going really crazy. And as much as Kissinger had to kind of massage and keep Nixon in control, uh, Dobrynin and other Russian officials had to keep Brezhnev under wraps too. Uh, but- When you see the US ambassador, right? Yes. And Kosygin is somebody big in the Soviet Union. I, I, I can't remember. Dobrynin was one of the ones uh, he was in in Moscow at that point. Okay. And so was so was Kosygin. And they were trying to keep Brezhnev under control. Okay. Uh, again, the Russians are literally threatening to send in troops. If the United States is not going to stop Israel, we will. And then the United States says, if you're going to step in, get ready for us to step in. And I mentioned it in the uh, beginning of this. Um, they uh, declared DEFCON 3, which is uh, preparedness for war. And um, ultimately, the Soviets back off first. And then the United States backs off. And then we get the ceasefire put into place. But I think since 1962, that was the closest moment for a military confrontation between the two superpowers. It really, <laughs> part of the problem here, the Soviets may not have been intending to send in troops. There were memos written in, well, I don't know what the Egyptian language is called. It's not Farsi, whatever it is, in the Egyptian language that Personnel and troops are can be can be defined in the same from the same Egyptian word. And when the United States was reading these memos, they're reading it as troops. And it might not have been troops. It might have been just personnel who were going to in at some sort of supervisory capacity or whatever. But nonetheless, um, we reacted to it strongly. And, and but ultimately. They pull off, pull out, and um, the crisis is over. Now, why did I say this? I said this is last month. This is one of the most significant events. Um, uh, 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 it changed the nature of, of the situation in the Middle East. 
the Yom Kippur War. One, Israel's sense of security is gone. They know uh, that they cannot necessarily depend on just being easily able to push the Arab armies around. Uh, two, at the end of this war, Egypt got what it want. It was able to claim, a regain, they regained their honor. I think Israel ceded a little bit of territory to them on the other side of the canal, so Egypt would have control of the canal. Egypt would never be a player in the Arab-Israeli crisis after this. They were the leader of the anti-Israeli uh, coalitions in all the previous wars. They are not a part of them. They will never be again. They ceded the this, this Sinai, Peninsula. Sinai Peninsula, and it was it essentially gave them control of yeah. the um, the Syrian, years later. of the Suez Canal. Yes, the Suez Canal. Um, third, and maybe the biggest thing is it now became clear. Uh, Kissinger had been hoping not to offend the uh, Arabs. Huh, didn't work. Uh, the Arabs were now in large measure anti-American. Um, they were allied with the Soviets who would be their major supplier for many, many years. And Israel would now become our responsibility. If the uh, Soviets are going to take the Arab side in the Arab-Israeli conflict, then by definition of the Cold War, we had to take the other side. And again, I think most people, myself included, have thought that the relationship between Israel and the United States was always one of comedy, was always one of we're, we've got their backs. And it was not always. But from 1973 on, it is. And it is for sure. I mean, you could argue that it starts earlier. But by 1973 and the end of the Yom Kippur War, it really is clear. Um, and uh, ne next month's uh, topic is, is the OPEC oil embargo. The Arabs, one of the ways they were going to show their displeasure with American actions in resupplying Israel, and not just that, after the war was over, giving them a $2 billion um, package just to help them recover. The Arabs were furious and they turned off the spigots. Uh, they started off by saying, um, we're going to reduce production by 5% every month until Israel returns to its pre-1967 borders. And we're increasing the price of a barrel of oil 70%. Um, then that $2, million, $2 billion package given to Israel, turn off the spigots. And uh, I, I was a, I pumped gas at that time. Um, <laughs> uh, the lines were six and seven blocks long. And I you could only pump them. so much. And you would uh, limit to what you could have. You could have $5 or whatever we said you could have. Alternating days with your registration, remember? For the, yeah. I'll walk before I ever pay a dollar down for gas. Yeah. <laughs> 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 And the price of gas and everything else, its economic impact was enormous. It lasted really about a year, but that's a big, big story. And then finally, we have the Camp David Accords, and it's one of the ongoing processes of the Middle, Middle East. There's always some peace negotiation going on with one neighbor or another neighbor, and uh, Arab neighbor, and uh, they sometimes offer hope and then sometimes disappoint hope, but they've been a a regular part of our world ever since. On um, uh, and then in between wars break out, whether it's in Lebanon or wherever it might be. Um, and uh, I, I think I said. Well, yeah, you had the 1982 Lebanon, and then Gaza, Gaza, and, and left in 205. Yeah, left in 205 and. You know, yep. And uh, I, I said one time, and this is something I, I really believe. If you're doing those word pictures where you said um, the more frequently a word is said, uh, the larger it is in print, and the less frequently the smaller. There have been moments when the Arab-Israeli conflict was at the center of our attention, as it is right now. But it's never been away from our consciousness. I can't think of any year in my life. Yes, sir. Yeah, I wanted to say something just before we go on. It's not going to be long. It's not a discussion point. 
I wanted to say, ask a question whether the Golan Heights is now a part of the Israeli maps. The second thing I wanted to ask is, can nuclear weapons be you be deployed in such a confined space? I don't know. And um, do you think there were um, intelligence lapses in this Hamas case? And also, uh, it's it's pertinent to note that the Saudis were just about to recognize Israel's um, right to exist just before Hamas plant. I mean, Egypt did it in 1979, I think. I think um, Jordan did it Jordan. In, in the 90s and the UAE did it in 2020. And just about when Saudi was supposed to do it, this is when it came about. So I just wanted to, oh. to say that that's what is going on Perfect. in my mind as far as what's going on now is concerned. Perfect context, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and was there a failure of, of Israeli intelligence and American intelligence, yes. And it reminds me a little bit of, of Pearl Harbor. In Pearl Harbor, if you wanted to, you could go back to the history and say, oh, we knew this piece of information, and we had this piece of information, and this, and never put it all together. I think they had lots of clues and never put them together. But clearly, uh, Israel was caught with their guard down. Uh, and so that's going on. I'm not someone who's expert in the nuclear weapons field, but I know that there are, um, smaller nuclear weapons that they can use in battlefield situations. So I assume you could, but I don't know. Um, and uh, the Golan Heights. Golan Is it a part of the map of Israel right now? We are building settlements there still. Israel is building settlements there still. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that the 73 war points out is that from now on in, if you want to talk about a solution to the Arab-Israeli conflict or the, or the fate of the Palestinians or whatever issue in that area you're concerned with, one of the impediments is going to be the occupied territories. That um, one of the, the, I think the central reason the occupied territories are important to Israel is the same reason that Eastern Europe was important to the Soviet Union. It's a buffer zone. Buffer zone. Before you had that, if you cross the Syrian border, you were yes. in Israeli territory, Israel. Israeli populations. Yeah. Or if you cross yeah. the Suez, now there are there's miles of territory, mm -hmm. um, and you have to go over. And so it acted as a kind of defensive measure. That Israel is not likely to easily give that up if they yeah. ever will, uh, and that will always be an impediment in terms of uh, how the Arab states and the Palestinians uh, respond to this thing. Um, yeah. and, and I know if, if you were going to solve it, the year to solve it was 1968. Yeah. And at this point, there's a term in, in law, stare decisis. Mm -hmm. Once something has become accepted as a reality mm -hmm. in people's lives, it is much, much harder to overturn that reality. And uh, this is now, you know, 67, that's 33, 56 years ago. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it's going to be, it would almost be akin to uh, Mexico saying, we want Arizona and California Texas. back. And Texas it's back. Really yeah. ours. It's and it's not going to happen. So I don't know what will happen there. Um, anybody else have anything else they want to throw in here? I know I talk a whole lot, so. Not only that, but if you go back, when they say trading land for peace, since the before 48 with the Darfur Agreement, Israel was supposed to be a major part of Jordan. And the British mandate and all that, they mm -hmm. carved it away and it down. And, uh, and like I said, even after the war where they relinquished the Sinai Peninsula and stuff like that, and as you say, with the Golan Heights, that is a hilltop that they have to keep for a defensive It's a position. great defensive position. Absolutely. They have to. But they've, over all these years, they've given up so much land for peace, they've never gotten it. But Israel at this point, after 1967, was five times as large as it was prior to the war. It's an enormous change in their geography, and it changes the geography of the Middle East 
Uh, well, then they get back to sign. But it was nowhere right. near what the original League of Nations agreement was and all that, that the British mandate. Yes. But when Israel was first established in 48, it was a very small strip of land. Yes. It looked, it was more convoluted than a typical American congressional district. Yeah. And, um, and, and not but, defensible. But, but now, but now, I gather that the United Nations or whoever tried to give make the 1948 original boundaries places with lots of Jewish settlement to Israel and places without, not to Israel. Um, but then when the Arabs attacked, it was an excuse to give Israel a real a defensible, well, right. really not defensible, I, I, but a I, less than defensible. Just a, a, a kind of a larger point outside of this war. Of this war and and the Middle East, one of the worst things that the imperial powers did, and then the European powers after the end of empire did, was draw map lines on maps. Every time they did that, it mm -hmm. created some, it India and issues. Pakistan. It created more terrible Iraq. Combined three distinct tribes that each hated each other. Yes, and they're all together in. You are looking for trouble, and you're going to find it. Um, it's it just is a mess. The other thing um, in the '67 war, when the planes left and attacked Egypt from the north, where they didn't expect it, and wiped out 80 to 90 percent of the Egyptian airfields and all that, and did the same thing with uh, Syria. That allowed, in a few days later, their tanks and all to get within. 80 miles of Cairo, yep. 60 miles of Damascus, and, yep. and that's what well, uh, sealed the deal. A, a turning point in this war is they had broken through Syrian lines and were able to bomb the, Damascus. Right. They hit no targets that mattered. But psychologically, the, the fact that you're getting hit, such deep. we're vulnerable. Like Jimmy do a little. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna end. Well, listen, uh thank you, Michael. That actually was really helpful. Yeah. I, 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 appreciate I, I, th I think that was actually really excellent. So I appreciate I, it. Oh, I appreciate it. Uh next month is the oil embargo. All of us lived through it and and all of us had experiences, whether it was in long gas lines or whatever. Uh bring them to it. I uh, if, if I think there's a, a weakness to what I do here is I talk too much. And uh and if if everybody brings their own experiences to it, you are it is not interrupting. It is adding to what we're doing here. I really always appreciate what what whether it's you, Reba, or Baron, or uh, Paul, or Jean, or any whatever they add, it, and the, everybody around this table. Uh, it really is uh, a good addition. It's a lot uh, easier to interrupt when you're here in person. Though. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> but but on Zoom, um, if I'm not looking at you and I don't see it. Just yell out uh, because sometimes my vision doesn't take things in. But I'm going to end the recording, say thank you all very, very much, and I uh, hope to see you all next month. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you all. John Le Carre, in all his books, praises the Israeli intelligence as being the best in the world, oh. bar none. And, and yet, doesn't mean you can't be perfect.